This is a series of five classes on epistemology, the theory of knowledge. And my book, How We Know, is the text for the course, but the classes will not recap the book. They're not tied to the book. But I do want to read this opening paragraph from the preface because it's eloquent and I didn't want to try to come up with eloquence a second time. One time is all I've got. Mankind has existed for 400,000 years, but 395,000 of those years were consumed by the Stone Age. The factor that freed men from endless toil and early death the root cause of the elevated level of existence that we now take for granted is one precious value, knowledge. The painfully acquired knowledge of how to master nature, how to organize social existence, and how to understand himself is what enabled man to rise from the cave to the skyscraper from warring clans to a global economy, from an average lifespan of less than 30 years to one approaching 80 years, close quote. Now to just give you an idea of the magnitude of what we're talking about, this line represents in length, it's scaled to 400,000 years and the last little bit where I have an arrow pointing is the period of civilization, the post-Stone Age, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. It goes back to the founding of civilization in Sumeria and ancient Egypt 3,000 years ago. So you see what a tiny, tiny sliver of the history of the human race has been civilized, has had the knowledge required to achieve a civilized level of existence, even if you are talking about ancient Egypt as a civilized level of existence. How do we acquire knowledge? Why did it take so long? It took so long because people had no knowledge to work from. They were starting from ground zero and knowledge builds on knowledge, and they didn't know how to gain knowledge. So these classes are on the most important thing there is. How do we learn? How do we acquire knowledge? They're on epistemology. What facts of reality give rise to the need for the science of epistemology? I want to tell you a story about myself at age four. Washing my hands, I got a startling idea. It just came to me like a revelation. If you dried your hands with the soap still on them, you would never catch a cold. It just, it just dawned on me with blinding certainty. And I ran into my mother to tell her about my great discovery. And I don't remember what she said, but in a nice, amused way, she said, in effect, that might not be true. I don't know if that will hold up, or whatever she said. And I remember that that was the first time it occurred to me. So the mere idea that it feels right doesn't mean it's really true. That's the basis of epistemology. That's what gives rise to it. The mere presence of an idea in your mind, no matter how good that idea feels, is not any warrant for accepting it. Ideas need to be justified. They need to be established. Belief that goes beyond the rational support is an irrational belief. There's a proper way of arriving at an idea and a proper way of demonstrating that you arrived at it correctly. It is this that epistemology defines, derivation and validation. 
Think of it this way. Knowledge is a mental product. A mental product. And as with making any product, to make knowledge, one has to work up the right materials in the right way. Just as in engineering, you want to build a bridge, you have to use the right materials and assemble them in the right order in the right way. Epistemology is the engineering of making knowledge. It tells you how to make knowledge and how to test that you've properly done it. Ayn Rand's definition of epistemology, a science devoted to the discovery of the proper methods of acquiring and validating knowledge. There's no science more important than epistemology because knowledge is what makes us human. What is knowledge? That's the first question of epistemology and the first question of my talk. Let's consider some examples first on the animal level. I have two cats. They both know me. And they know my wife, Jean. My one cat knows how to get outside by using the pet door. The other cat doesn't. A squirrel knows where it's buried its nuts for the winter. Those are on the animal level. What about on the level of a human infant? Well, a human infant knows its mother after a certain short period, recognizes its mother. It knows that the milk bottle coming towards it is bringing something good. Later, the infant becomes a child, learns to count, knows how to count, learns how to read, learns how to add two and two, and becomes an adult, and he knows a whole raft of things, even if he's not living in 21st century America. He knows how to use money to buy and sell. He knows that there's such a thing as health and illness and knows something about how to keep himself well. Or if he's a scientist today, he knows the laws of physics. If he's an electrical engineer, he knows Ohm's law. If he's a programmer, he knows how to write an app. So that's a whole range of knowledge. What do they have in common? Well, in order to answer that, this will be one of the themes of the course, you have to say, as opposed to what? All these things from the first example of a cat knowing me as opposed to a stranger, to a programmer knowing how to write an app, or a state of consciousness. So what would we contrast that with? Well, imagine you're riding in a car, and you're looking out the window, and the scenery's going by. That's not knowledge. It's awareness, but if you're just watching it, that's not knowledge. You dial a phone number, somebody says, uh, you call up so-and-so, it's 239956, and you dial it in. You have no intention to remember it. And five minutes later, he says, oh, dial it again. What was it? I didn't, I didn't store it, I don't remember. That's not knowledge. Knowledge is retained awareness. It's something you possess. I have the knowledge that Albany is the capital of New York State. I have it. It's a possession. You can recall it. Squirrel can recall where it stashed the nuts for the winter. Or a programmer can recall how to set up a loop. So the first thing we can say about knowledge is that it's a form of awareness it's not a momentary awareness, it's a retained, recallable awareness. And there are two types of it, perceptual level, sensory, and conceptual, abstract, intellectual knowledge. Now that supplies the genus, if you know that term, for the definition of knowledge, it's a retained mental product. Ayn Rand has discussed what is the distinguishing characteristic for knowledge, and I'm going to give it to you in stages. The distinction characteristic begins, it's a mental grasp of a fact or facts of reality. And that's really the essence. 
It's a grasp of fact. Now, notice it's a grasp. It's not an acquaintance with or brushing up against or a flick at. It's a grasp. It's something that you have and hold and then put away. The word grasp is very important. And it's a grasp of reality. Next part of the definition, reached either by perceptual observation or a process of reason. A process of reason based on perceptual observation. That's the essential of the objectivist epistemology, right in that definition. That it's awareness, a fact, reached by basing it on perception. See, uh, no philosophers really today would agree with any of this. Uh, many of them would not agree it's mental. Not, I, I don't think any of them would agree that it's a grasp. They define it in terms of belief often. And they would agree probably that it's perceptual or rational, but the idea of basing it on reason they think is impossible to do. Basing it on perception is it's a big question. How do you do that? And they think that that has not been solved. But I digress. Now, let's highlight two aspects. It's a mental grasp. It's a mental grasp of a fact of reality. So we got mind and reality, the two big issues in philosophy, consciousness and existence. And the first thing that you have to know about knowledge once you understand what it has to do with is that consciousness and existence are axioms. Yes, that's a definition of axiom, as it's supposed to be. Axioms are fundamental, this is my definition, fundamental self-evident truth standing at the basis of all knowledge. And by self-evident, objectivism defines self-evident as available to direct awareness, which includes both sense perception and introspection, because we don't perceive with our senses that we are conscious. We are aware of ourselves that we are conscious directly. How do you know that you are awake? You don't look in the mirror and, oh yes, my eyes are open. You don't use your senses, you just are aware that you are aware. How do you know when you feel a pain that you're in pain? You experience it directly. Someone else might have to infer it from your behavior that you're in pain, but you know it directly. So direct awareness includes both external perception through the senses and the awareness of our own awareness. And the axiom is inescapable. It has to be used and accepted even in the attempt to deny it. So if a person says, I'm not conscious, consciousness is a myth. Consciousness is a superstition, said the founder of behaviorism. Well, what is a superstition? A superstition is a belief that's not based on any reason but, and is semi-mystical. A belief? What is a belief? Well, belief is a person's conscious idea. Oh, so in saying consciousness does not exist, consciousness is a superstition, you're saying, I know that I don't know, that I'm not here, that I'm not... Conscious. So you have to reaffirm it, and the same, of course, for existence. If you say nothing exists, then you assume your statement exists, you assume you exist to state it, you, you assume your knowledge exists of the meaning of those words. Maybe if you're talking to somebody, if you are, then you assume they exist. So you're familiar with that point that the axioms are inescapable. You can't even deny them, let alone 
avoid them. Doesn't show the axioms are true because the axioms are too basic to be proved. Proof is what we resort to when we don't have direct awareness. Proof is a second best. So we don't prove the axioms because we have something better than proof of the axioms. We see, there it is, existence. It's all around you. Even underneath you it's existence. Even inside you it's existence. And we are directly aware that we are conscious, so the idea of proving it of even needing to prove it or wanting to prove it or proving it being a good thing is completely backwards. I was thinking about an analogy if there were people who were roofers and they go up on ladders every day and they work all day standing on the ladder working on the roof. And one of them says that finally, how do we ever get up here? And the his friend says, on the ladder. Yeah, but we would need a ladder to get to the ladder. And then we need a ladder to get to that ladder. So how do we ever get going? So you'd have to pretend that he's been on the ladder so long he's forgotten about the ground and walking. So he, his only idea of moving to one place to another is a ladder, and that creates a problem. Well, it's the same with proof. You get so enamored of proof and so used to proof, you forget that proof is what we resort to when something is not directly experienced or perceived. So the idea of proving the axioms is, is absurd as using a ladder to get to a ladder. Okay, let's look at these axioms in more detail. A list of three axioms of objectivism. The first axiom, existence, identity and consciousness. I've mentioned existence and consciousness. Identity is a corollary of existence, as we'll see. First thing you know about existence is it exists. That's inherent in the concept of existence. The second thing is that it is what it is. To be is to be something. Existence is identity. There is no, nothing that is nothing. What is, is something. The third thing is that existence consists of entities. When I say thing, now I mean an entity, something with attributes, something that undergoes actions, something that has characteristics. All characteristics, all relationships, all actions are of entities. That is perceptually given. Look out. You see all the entities? And finally, I would include as part of the axiom of existence that entities act according to their identity, which is the law of causality. The next axiom is on the list that's not already covered is consciousness. And the first thing you need to know about consciousness is that it's conscious. The second thing is that it's someone's consciousness. There's no just floating consciousness. It's my consciousness and your consciousness. Consciousness is somebody being aware of something. The third thing is that consciousness is an active process. And here we get into some more um, rarefied material. And there's a tendency among philosophers in history to view consciousness as static, as passive, as inactive. Objectivism stresses, in fact, the very first sentence of introduction to objectivist epistemology. Do you remember the very first sentence? Consciousness as a state of awareness is not a passive state, but an active process. And finally, about consciousness, I would stress that consciousness is a biological faculty. This also greatly distinguishes the Aristotelian and objectivist approach to knowledge and to consciousness from the Platonic or even the Humean. Consciousness is good. Consciousness is something you use. 
The whole point of consciousness is to get the good and avoid the bad. Consciousness is a difference detector. It exists so that you eat the bread and not the poison. So that you run away from the lion, not into the lion's mouth. So that you can tell the pro-life from the anti-life and seek one, not the other. Now there's a certain relation among the axioms. And this is the analysis of the... The two paragraphs in Galt's speech contain the essence of objectivism, and I wanted to walk through them with you, starting here, go through it slowly. This states the relationship among the axioms. Existence exists, and the act of grasping that implies two corollary axioms. The act of grasping it, Consciousness is going to be the next thing mentioned. Consciousness is not inherent in existence. It's inherent in your knowing that existence exists. So first, it is. Then, you know it. And in knowing it, there are two corollary things implied. That you exist possessing consciousness, and something exists, I think I got them in the wrong order, okay. something exists which one perceives, and that one exists possessing consciousness, consciousness being the faculty perceiving that which exists. So these are two aspects of being conscious, that there's the thing you're conscious of, and you being conscious of it. As I said, consciousness is always someone's consciousness of something. The next point is polemical. The next paragraph is polemical, but boy, is it important. If nothing exists, then there can be no consciousness. A consciousness with nothing to be conscious of is a contradiction in terms. You can see this in the very concept of consciousness. Any act of con I saw, what did you see? Nothing. I just saw. I heard, what did you hear? Nothing. You didn't even hear a sound? No, I heard nothing. No, to hear is to hear something. Even I dreamed. What did you dream? I didn't dream anything. But you just said you dreamed. To dream is to dream something. To plan to want, to be in pain. Any action of consciousness implies an object, the thing that hurts you, the thing you're dreaming about, the thing you're planning. The th there can't be I'm conscious without I'm conscious of. Now this is not terribly um, denied in the history of philosophy, but the next part is her unbelievable answer, great answer to Descartes. Descartes, who launched the whole modern world in philosophy, said, yeah, of course we're always conscious of something, but maybe what we're conscious of is things in our own mind. I grant you, I think about something, but I think about something in my mind. So maybe when I look out at you, maybe you people are just things in my own mind, like my dreams and my thoughts. How do I know? How can I be certain that anything outside me exists? All I know is I am conscious of certain content. I don't know that there's anything besides my mind. Maybe Internal existence exists is all there is. Maybe everything that exists is only images in my mind. Bang. A consciousness conscious of nothing but itself, images in its own mind, is a contradiction in terms, she says. It's a contradiction in terms to say I'm locked up in my mind and only aware of my own mental content. Why? Before it could identify itself as consciousness, it had to be conscious of something. Now, what does that mean? How do you distinguish an image in your own mind from reality? 
in order to make that distinction, you have to have cases of being aware of what's not an image in your own mind and say, oh, well, the image is not like this. Like when I dream, I can make things move the way I want to. But when I look out, I can't make you move by, looking at, by doing the equivalent of what I do in, in dreams. So there is such a thing as perceiving, which is different from images in my mind. Then to say, but maybe even the perceiving is an image in my own mind, you destroy the concept of image in my own mind. Before you could identify that as an image in your mind, rather than reality, you had to be conscious of something. Otherwise, image becomes a stolen concept, and mind becomes a stolen concept. Those concepts depend upon a contrast with existence. So, there's a general table I'm going to give you that expresses what Ayn Rand expresses in those two paragraphs. And it's her concept, the primacy of existence, versus the error the primacy of consciousness, and I just wanted to give you the structure of it before I fill it in. It says, two metaphysical points for each, and two epistemological points for each. I couldn't put them all on the same slide. It just got, the types had to get too small. So I'm going to do the metaphysical part separate from the epistemological part. Okay, the metaphysical part for the primacy of existence, it's the view that existence is independent of consciousness. It exists whether there's consciousness or not, and the primacy of consciousness is just the reverse. Consciousness is independent of existence. The other part of the metaphysics is each side's view of the opposite. Consciousness is dependent, says the primacy of existence. Existence is dependent, says the primacy of consciousness. If God wished us away, we would go out of existence. God's consciousness controls everything. That's the primacy of consciousness view. Now, in epistemology, existence must be known before consciousness can be known. Before it could identify itself as consciousness, it had to be conscious of something. Before you can be aware of yourself in your own inner state, you, there has to be yourself, which means you have to be perceiving something. The primacy of consciousness is just the opposite. Consciousness can be known before existence is known. And that's whole, Descartes' whole project. I think, therefore I am. I know that my consciousness exists. I'm not sure about reality. All I know is that my mind exists. So consciousness can be known according to that wrong view before existence is known. And then the last two are about where does knowledge come from. Knowledge is, uh, of existence comes from perceiving it, from extrospection, or knowledge of existence comes from turning inward and looking at the contents of your mind which is the primacy of consciousness. The three approaches to knowledge, there are three approaches to knowledge, and there's an old joke that really captures them. One umpire says, I call them as they are, meaning balls and strikes. I call them as they are. The second one says, I call them as I see them. The third one says, they ain't nothing till I call them. <laughs> now, this lines up with the three schools of epistemology. You can't even call them the schools of epistemology. Three attitudes towards knowledge. One, the first one, I call them as they are. We just know. I'm infallible because I get a revelation about what the truth is. The second one is the right view. I call them as I see them. I identify them according to my sense perception. The third one is the subjectivist skeptic modern. They ain't nothing till I call them. Existence doesn't exist, 
Balls aren't balls and strikes aren't strikes. They're not anything. They have no identity until I confer it upon them by my arbitrary act of consciousness. So you may be surprised to see the objectivist correct position in the middle, which it happens to be here because of the way the joke has to climax on that last statement. Uh, but I want to make a general point. Whenever it looks like the truth is in the middle, think again. What you're really dealing with is this. I'm trying to show you rotating the, the line. Actually, the truth is at one end, and the two errors are closely related divergences at the other end. So what are the ends here? What makes this objective? I think it's something like the objectivist who calls him as he sees them accepts the responsibility of judgment. The other two schools, the mystics and the skeptics, are revolt against the responsibility of judgment. One of them wants automatic certainty, the mystics. I just know, I call them as they are, God talks to me. The other school says, nobody can know anything. And that's his solution to the requirement to work, to figure things out, and to stand by your judgment, which he's afraid of. So today we're at the climax of the battle of the mystics and the skeptics. The mystics are beheading people and trying to establish a global caliphate, enforcing Sharia law of the Koran. The skeptics are those like Hillary Clinton who have no respect for facts and pile lies upon lies, and those like Donald Trump who have no respect for facts and pile arbitrary emotional ejaculations upon arbitrary emotional ejaculations. So I said consciousness is biological. It has a function. What is Hillary's answer to what consciousness is to do? how we gain the knowledge we need to survive. Follow the collective. It takes a village. The science is settled. Why is it settled? Because there's a consensus of consciousnesses. 18 years with no measurable global warming, growing failure of all the climate models, what are mere facts in the face of the consensus of consciousnesses? Trump's answer to what to do is, I know how to make my whims beat the whims of others. I know the art of the deal, which is how to beat out the other guy. I'm strong. I'm so strong I can make Mexico build a wall to keep Mexicans from coming here. What's that? More Mexicans are leaving now than are entering the country. Don't bother me with facts. They ain't nothing till I call them. No one is standing up to say existence exists. A is A. No matter what the sacred texts say, no matter how many people won't perceive it, no matter how many schoolyard taunts one throws at one's opponents, Facts are facts. No one is standing up to say that knowledge does not come from other people, from scripture, from a village, from ayatollahs, or from cooked up computer models, but comes from the application of logic to observe facts. No one is saying that except us. Let's stop here and take some questions. Thank you. Al. Uh, Harry, my question has to do with two things you mentioned. First was the chart of the millennia of pre-knowledge humanity, and the other was your mention of learning not to run toward the lion but away from it. Does the fact that humankind survived millennia of abysmal ignorance suggests that that kind of knowledge was passed on in some way rather than having to be relearned. 
Um, so the question is, does the fact that um, we run away from the lion show that knowledge, I mean, that just taking that one example, uh, in the primitive pre-civilized knowledge, was it passed on? The fact that we survived, does that show that knowledge was passed on? Yes, but not that example. Uh, in, in knowing um, how, let's say, to use bones, to use sharp stones to, to cut the flesh off hide so you could put it on, that has to be transmitted. But running away from a lion doesn't have to be transmitted because the common experience of the individual would be enough to make him terribly afraid of, the, of any big roaring entity running towards him or potentially doing so. So he would have plenty of personal experiences of animals, some of whom are dangerous and some are not. Uh, no, no, uh, no Stone Age man is going to sit there and watch a lion run at him and not have any emotional reaction. So that particular example, but you're right that the, the hard-won knowledge is passed on and an interesting book was written by L. Sprague de Camp in the 50s or 60s, but why did, why did civilization begin in the Fertile Crescent at the end of the Mediterranean? He theorized, I think correctly, that that is the place on the planet that had the most interconnections with other population centers. So as opposed to say the civilization developing in the middle of the Brazilian rainforest, which eventually becomes the Aztecs, they don't communicate with a large body of people. But if you live at the end of the Mediterranean, you got Egypt and China on one side, and Northern Africa on the other, and if you can get up on the other side of the Mediterranean, the bottom of Europe, so that discoveries that were made anywhere in any population center can be transmitted to you. So it's a center of trade and a center of innovation so that ideas can build on ideas. And that's what you're talking about, that the transmission of knowledge is essential. Population density and intercommunication speeds up the transmission of knowledge. That's why we're at the singularity point that, uh, not exactly Ray Kurzweil's, but we're at an inflection point in the growth of knowledge because now all six billion, seven billion people on Earth are interconnected and ideas that somebody has in Thailand can be picked up by somebody in Brazil and invested in by an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley and pretty soon it's on all the iPhones all over the world. That's something entirely new, and it's wonderful. It's our only hope for the future. So thank you, Al, that the transmission of knowledge is very important. Next question. Uh, hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, so you touched briefly on uh, the justified true belief account of knowledge, which is the starting point for academic epistemology. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on the differences yes. between that and yours? Yes. She asked about JTB, justified true belief, is a contemporary uh, one theory. It's not, it's not that it's universally accepted by any means. One contemporary discussion point is what is knowledge justified true belief. And the problem of many with that is that belief is not a primary concept. Belief is more advanced than knowledge. Belief is something on which you act abstracted from whether it's a grasp of reality or not. So the first thing that you can conceptualize is, I see it, I don't see it. I know it, you know, I see it and remember it, or I don't see it and remember it. That is, I know, I don't know. Then you can get to Gee, later you get to, I thought it was this way, but it wasn't. I got it wrong. So some things that, I, like when I was four, some things I think I see and know are mistakes. 
And then you can get to a higher abstraction, belief. And then you can ask, how do we distinguish knowledge from belief? But they're not distinguished by belief being the primary. Like, we begin by believing. We begin by perceiving, and hence knowing. So, uh, knowledge is a specification of awareness. It's retained, recallable awareness. It's not the belief gets narrowed into true beliefs, true justified beliefs, and others. Belief is a very advanced derivative concept. Thank uh, so thank you. Uh, yes? In Rand's definition of knowledge, which you quoted in the beginning, I've never understood why does she add the whole sort of second part where she says it, it reached by a process yeah. and so forth. Why is that? elaboration on how you have to reach it included in the definitional I'm glad you statement. asked that because I skipped over it inadvertently in my notes. A concept for a product generally includes, the definition of a concept for a product generally incl includes the essential process that reaches it. So for instance, a cake is a baked good. It's a mixture of flour, water, sugar, eggs, that is baked and rises in an oven. Uh, a, and a, it's not universally true, but if the thing is particularly a product, I mean, many things are a product, but they're not kind of like perspicuously a product, like say an automobile. I wouldn't define an automobile in terms of the process of manufacture. And there isn't one process of manufacture. But a cake, knowledge, uh, an emotion, any product of consciousness has to give its provenance, the process, because consciousness is essentially an action. That's one of the aspects that I named, that when you're dealing with something like knowledge, you're dealing with the unusual in awareness. I'm overstressing it. But essentially, awareness is you're hearing me now, thoughts are going through your minds. It's a stream of consciousness, as William James called it. When something is frozen out of that and made permanent and put down into the brain in an encoded form, that is a special thing that needs to be discussed in terms of what led to that. And of course, the whole issue of epistemology, which is what we're concerned with, is how do you get to knowledge? How do you make it? Does it come from dreams? Does it come from the wise men telling you? Maybe. Okay, I'm, I'm open on that. The wise woman is telling me that I'm out of time and I have no independent means of verifying that, so <laughs> I will take that as knowledge. Thank you.